we're going to continue our, our study of, of 1 John. But let me remind you the basic context of 1 John. Why was John teaching? And that's in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. He says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So there are a series of tests throughout 1 John through which you might compare your life. But sometimes people will teach this in a way like almost as though John is writing this in order to expose all the false believers in the church. But that's not true. That, that will happen here. I mean, if you read this, some people will read this and realize, wow, I'm not a Christian. But that wasn't John's purpose. John's purpose was to affirm the faith of the people in that church, to let them know that they really were Christian, to give them assurance, to strengthen their assurance. It's not that they didn't have it. And why did he have to do that? Well, because of the things we're going to talk about tonight. And that is... When you read the whole book of 1 John, it appears that there were these false teachers who had come in. False teachers, false prophets. And um, they seem as though they were a kind of, um, of at least the beginning roots of what's called Gnosticism. It was, it's a thing that, of course, Gnosticism comes from gnosis or knowledge. It was all about knowledge. And basically for them, it was kind of an esoteric, which means dark or hidden knowledge. So, so imagine there's a group of believers and they're sincere believers. And, and they're, they're, they're believing they have eternal life and they're reconciled with God through faith in Jesus Christ and His work on Calvary and His resurrection. As someone told me at the Radford campus, or, or mentioned to someone at the Radford campus after I preached the gospel there, they said, can it really be that simple? Can salvation really be that simple? Not simplistic, but simple. And the answer is yes. Faith exclusively in what Jesus Christ has done for us or what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. So let's imagine you have a group of believers. They're learning to love one another. They're, they're learning to walk in obedience. Uh, John rightfully can call them children. And they have not a simplistic, but a very simple faith. You know, um, kind of like Jesus loves me, this I know because the Bible tells me so. I'm saved because Christ died for me. And then imagine this group of people come in, maybe not many, maybe a few teachers, maybe a group, and they, they're acting all mystical and super spiritual. And they've got all kinds of rules. Maybe they've combined some, some Greek religion with Judaism. Maybe they just got a hodgepodge of all these seemingly uh, spiritual rules and rituals and ideas. And then they kind of have this thing where some of them possess this esoteric or hidden knowledge. And if you don't have it, you're not in the club. Do you see what's going on? And what is it doing? Same thing as in Colossians. The devil's coming in and seeking to move people away from that simple faith in the promises of God to some complex, esoteric, mysterious nonsense so that they stop putting the emphasis on the person of Christ and start putting it on, on rules and ideas and certain you know, um, dark and hidden mysteries. And here's what you need to see. Satan, when he, when he wants to attack, here's what I've noticed, not only in the church, but in society. He corrupts. He distorts. He perverts. For example, our country is experiencing a tremendous upheaval in, in just moral or, or, uh, corruption of sexual perversion. And what he can't pervert, do you know what he does? He kills. I mean, I remember when, when I was a little boy that the argument was children would be aborted only in the most extreme cases and only in the first few weeks. And people were, no, no, this is wrong. No. Now what are we arguing? We can abandon them? after they've come out of the womb and let them die? 
So you see, man has inside of him, or all men have something of the imagio dei, the, ima- the image of God. And what Satan can't twist and corrupt, he'll kill. Now in the church, it's the same way. He comes in and what he can't twist and corrupt, that's usually his first go-to. Corrupt the church, corrupt the doctrine with complex and and mysterious uh, doctrines and rules and everything to keep people away from just a simple faith in Christ and walking in love to something else other than Christ. And if he can't do that, what will he do to the church? Come in and kill it. Persecute it. You see? Well, what we're seeing here is John's not only talking to believers about, look, you need to make sure you're saved. You need to really see fruit in your life. But he's he's also dealing with the fact that there are these false teachers that come in and said, you guys really aren't the real deal. You really aren't, you know, followers of Christ maybe, or you really aren't in that upper echelon of spirituality and you need what we have. The problem is what they have is something other than Christ. And that's why John is going to begin to talk about Antichrist. Okay? So, he's already talked about one enemy, hasn't he? In verses 15 through 17 in chapter 2. And what is that enemy? The world. It's an enemy, okay? And here's the way Paul deals with that enemy. Uh, The world has been crucified to me. And what else? I to the world. Alright? So... It's one thing uh, to say the world stinks to me, okay? But what if you don't stink to the world? So you say the world stinks to you, but you don't necessarily stink to the world, and so the world's always inviting you in. But if the world stinks to you, and you stink to the world, It's going to cause a big separation, isn't it? It's going to be a lot easier to keep the two apart. And that's what Paul's saying. Paul looks at the world and he says, it stinks to me. It's a rotten cesspool of sin. Now, when he talks about the world, he's not talking about trees, flowers, or baby penguins, okay? He's talking about these rotten, godless ideologies, moral corruption. He says, it stinks to me. But guess what? Paul stunk to the world. And how did he stink to the world? By being obnoxious? No. Every time you talk to Paul, it was about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that's, the world hated it. Every time he talked to the world, he talked, about, talked to the world. It, he talked to them about spiritual realities. Now, I'm not talking about going home and being obnoxious to your family and 24 hours a day rebuking them. But I'm talking about not only did he look at the world and see that it he didn't want it, he walked so close to Christ that the world didn't really want him either. You see, if this really good looking guy says that he's really not interested in any of the girls, it's still a problem if he's a really good looking guy. But if he's not interested in the girls and he's pretty ugly, there's not going to be much of a problem, is there? Girls aren't going to be chasing him around. Well, that's kind of the point. Not that you should be obnoxious to the world in the sense of a bad attitude or a legalist or always nagging at people, but you should be so close to Christ that, well, some people are just going to say, don't come around anymore. I got so, not depressed, but, well, maybe a little, my second year after I became a Christian in college because I realized something. No one wanted me around unless they wanted Jesus. I guess maybe that's a good thing. But I realized people who did not want to talk about Jesus did not want to talk to me. They, didn't no, long, they no longer wanted to be my friend. And they'd be my acquaintance, but I was no longer in the club. You see? Now, so the world is one big enemy, isn't it? But now he's going to talk, he's going to use terminology of antichrist. Okay? And that, I know that sounds kind of spooky. 
and something otherworldly and something out there in the eschaton, what we say in the final days, you know. But there are, there are different ways in which the idea of Antichrist is used. I believe, I firmly believe that one day the Antichrist is going to appear. I do believe that. I believe in a literal, physical Antichrist, a man who will rise up. And you see the word Antichrist, or the word Antichrist, the word anti there doesn't just mean against, okay? It means in the place of. Someone who pretends to be the Christ puts himself in the position of God. And that occurs today. I'll never forget, I, I, I lived for many years in Peru. And usually if you go into a corner store, everything's a corner little market, you know, They'll have religious signs, you know, Catholic signs to be a picture of Jesus with a flaming heart or a picture of Mary or, or something. And I remember walking into a, a little grocery like that and saw a big poster and had a picture of the Pope on it. And this is what it said. Nuestro Padre, Padre Celestial. Our Heavenly Father. Now what's going on there? Putting someone in the place of God. That's wrong. You don't use that kind of language. Even Jesus said, don't call anyone father. And he wasn't talking about don't call your dad father. He was talking about don't put someone with that kind of terminology in the place of God. You see, and there are many, many antichrists today. Those who would put themselves against the teaching of Christ and the person of Christ are those who would try to put themselves in place of Christ and make themselves the important thing in your salvation. You see, for example, I really admire the I really admire the, what the Bible teaches about about Mary, the mother of our Lord. But I make her antichrist when I put her in the place of Christ, if I put her in that place of Christ, which I'm not going to do, if I make her an intercessor between me and Jesus and God, then I've taken something very, very beautiful and I've twisted it into something dark. Or I love the Apostle Paul. I mean, greatest missionary theologian in the history of the church. But if you make the Apostle Paul a mediator between you and Christ, Man, you've done something wrong. Very wrong. He hasn't. Mary hasn't. But you have. You put nothing in the place of Christ. And although we can learn from each other, and although there are older, maybe elders and preachers, and, and we ought to, if they deserve respect, show them respect according to what the Bible says. But, but there's no one that stands in the place of Christ. There's no infallible religious figure. You see, that's very, very important. Even the Apostle Paul admired the Bereans because when he taught them, they searched the Scriptures to see if this was so. I mean, they're checking out the Apostle Paul. So if you're ever in a church and, and you start asking the preacher questions and he says to you, you have no right to be questioning me, get out of that church really, really quick. Do you see? Because there's only one inerrant, inspired source of biblical knowledge, and it's the Bible. Okay? Now, let's, let's look at, at the text. Now, in verses 15 through 17, he's talking about the dangers of the world. Now, in verse 18, children. Now, look, he starts off with children again. That doesn't mean he's just talking to the kids. Remember what I told you before, there is a sense in which we're always all children. I was writing a thing on discipleship today and I, I was explaining the difference between Christian discipleship and all other kinds of discipleship. You know, in, in, in discipleship that you may see in the Orient or, you know, that type of thing, it's like you become, you seek to become equal with your master. And then in some of these, you know, Kung Fu movies, the master says you're to go beyond me, you know. That never happens in Christianity. In Christianity, you and I never become the master. We're always disciples. 
You see, so he refers to them as children. That's also letting them know, look, you're not beyond being deceived. You're not beyond needing the exhortation and the warning that I'm about to give you. Children, it is the last hour. Now, what does the last hour mean? Have you ever heard some one of these TV evangelists stand up and say, you know, we're in the last days? Well, we've been in the last days for the last 2,000 years. I didn't know if you knew that or not. Did you know that? On the day of Pentecost, Peter says, we're in the last days. And what does that mean? All throughout the Bible, there was this looking ahead to the last days, the days of the Messiah, when the Messiah would appear and do a work of salvation, you see, that would bring an end to the, to the, the rift, the turmoil between God and man. God and His people that would set everything right. Those last days began with the coming, the death, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. We have been in the last days for 2,000 years. And for 2,000 years, there have been antichrists. Now, that doesn't eliminate the idea, the truth, I believe truth, that there will one day come a the antichrist. But we've been in a world with antichrist for many, many, many years. So he says, it is the last hour and just as you heard. So this must have been important because he's told them this before or someone else in the apostolic band has told this, them this before. He goes, children, it is the last hour and just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming. He is. It's in the planning. It's in the making. We don't know when. We don't know when. And be very careful of interpreting your Bible through the newspaper. Okay? Because you can go back and, you know, when Hitler rose up, what did, what did a lot of people think? It's the Antichrist. Well, he was a Antichrist. The Reformers, what did they believe? They believed that the Pope was the Antichrist. Well, in many cases, he was the Antichrist because he put himself in the place of Christ. Okay? And it goes on, Mussolini. Some thought Mussolini. Saddam Hussein. I remember seeing it, some cheesy book that was written that Saddam Hussein was the Antichrist. So let's not do that, okay? Don't interpret the Bible through your newspaper. Just look at Scripture. Now, he says, Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Remember what Jesus warned His disciples about? If someone says the Christ is over there or the Christ is over here, don't you listen to them? When I come back, He says, it'll be like lightning going from the east to the west. Everyone will know it. Okay? It won't be a hidden thing. Yet how many, even Charles Manson, you know, pretending to be something. In, in Brazil right now, there's a man who... And, and in Latin America, there's a man who, who calls himself, you know, Christ. That Christ has come back, you see. The Jehovah Witnesses said Jesus was going to come back. What was it? In 1914 or something. And when He didn't come back, they said, well, He came back spiritually. You see? No, He says, when I come back, there'll, there'll be no doubt. He won't just appear as a man. He will come from the heavens and all will see Him. Okay? There will be no doubt. Okay? But, so, He's going to go from talking about this Antichrist with an art, you know definite article to many Antichrists have appeared and from this we know that it is the last hour. Now, it goes on 19. And he's going to say something very interesting. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. It appears that this group of people that Paul's talking about, that he's labeling Antichrist, I mean that John's talking about, that he's labeling Antichrist, were people who started out within Orthodox Christianity. Okay? Maybe they heard the Gospel... Maybe in this time in the church, like in the case with Philip 
And the magician, you know, he saw the, they saw the power, they saw the life, they saw what was going on, maybe the miracles and everything else, and they latched themselves on to Orthodox Christianity. But he says, but they did not stay with us, they went out from us. Now, what does this not mean? Okay, I go to Christ Church Radford, okay? They're, they're in Radford. I go to church, I like the church, I, I respect the elders. Um, and if you're a member there and you decide, mm, uh, I'm going to go to another church, another evangelical church, good, solid, basic evangelical church. You went out from our church and you went and joined that other church, right? That's not what he's talking about. That doesn't make you an apostate. That doesn't make you an antichrist because you left a good church and went to another church. That's not what it's talking about. As a matter of fact, if you're ever in a church that tells you if you don't stay in our church, you're apostate, then leave. Okay? Okay. Now, if you were in our church and you were going to go join a cult, that would be different. But we're talking, and I mean a real cult, you know, where you, you know, wear moose horns on your head and stuff. We would say, yeah, you've got some serious theological problems. But the, the point that we're, that we're saying here is they went out from Orthodox Christianity. They went out from historical Christianity. You know, you and I may have some differences in what we believe about minor details. And that won't make you a heretic. It won't make me apostate because we differ in those minor details. That's not what Paul's talking about. For example, I, have, I am Baptist and I believe in believer's baptism. I have many dear friends who are Presbyterian, you see, that have another view with regard to baptism but, but are within the realm of Orthodox Christianity. Do you see what I'm saying? What Paul is talking about is when someone professes an orthodox faith, a historical faith in the gospel, and then walks away from that. And they can walk away from that into nothing. I've seen that happen. I don't believe anything anymore. But for the most part, what a lot of times happen is they'll walk from that into something that pretends to be Christian or an offshoot of Christianity or usually something higher than normal Christianity. Now, I want to use this time to help you with regard to how do we interpret the Bible. We're going to get back to the Antichrist thing. But here's what I want you to see. Let's say that you said um, to me, uh, what would be a good question? Um, how do you know that, that uh, salvation is only through Jesus? And I say, well, bless God, that's what my Bible says. Okay? You ever heard someone talk that way before? Well, here's what you need to understand. The Bible is infallible. Okay? Let me put it, it's inspired. It's God-breathed. Okay? It's inerrant. It has no errors. And it's infallible. That means it's incapable of errors. That's the Bible. But here's what you need to see. My interpretation of the Bible is not inspired. It's not inerrant. I'm not without error. And, it's, and I'm not infallible. I'm not incapable of error. You see? So even if I'm a sincere man and I have the fruit of a Christian and I interpret, try to interpret the Bible in its grammatical, historical context, I can still slip up. Do you see that? So now, what could I do to, to help myself? To, sure that, to make sure that I'm really still being Christian. Well, I could talk to you. Say you're a Christian, you love the Lord, I could talk to you. Um, I could talk to, even go a step further, I could talk to the elders in our church. That would be good. All right. But we're all kind of, a, you know, we're all kind of from Virginia and we're all from the 21st century. Well, me from the 20th century, almost the 19th century, but... Um, you see, we're all kind of from the same place. So what if someone says, yeah, but you're all kind of from the same place and therefore you think the same way and you interpret the Bible with the same kind of presuppositions. You see what I'm saying? So even though the Scriptures themselves assure us that the believer can't understand the Scriptures, in our principles of hermeneutics, that's our study of how do you study the Bible, 
there's one principle that is not often mentioned, but it's very important. And that is, we always study the Bible or do our theology in the context of the church. What does that mean? When I interpret the Bible some way, as a, as a Bible teacher, okay, do you know what I do? I go back into history. I may even go back as far as the second century. I may go to Augustine. I may go to the Fathers. I will definitely go to the Reformers. I may go to the Puritans and the early Evangelicals. And here's a good principle. If all of them are in agreement with regard to what a certain verse means, all of them, and I disagree, who's probably wrong? Come on now. You answer the question. Who's probably wrong? <laughs> no, come on. This is serious. Who's probably wrong? You. Me, right? Do you see that? So that's one of the ways in which I want you to see is that, you know, that's one of the things, that's one of the principles of interpretation that, that we hold on to, of course, at Radford. So that it's not like, oh, Christianity or wisdom was born with us and it'll die with us. But it's humbly thinking this way. I want to stay in the center of historic Christianity in that great line of redeemed people who believed that the Bible was the Word of God. I want to stay in that group. And so knowing my... you know, I, I had a young guy just recently got really mad at me because he said, I got my Bible, then that's all I need because my Bible is the Word of God. And I said, yes, your Bible is the Word of God, but you are fallible. So wouldn't it be helpful to interpret Scripture with other believers? With other people? He couldn't see it. Man, that right there is the makings of a cult leader. I don't want to be smart aleck, but there's a humility of going, of saying, wisdom wasn't born with me and it won't die with me. And when I study the Bible, I'm going to compare what I see not to every person in the world, not to certain groups or churches that you know are heretical, not to people who deny the Scripture or say that tradition is higher than Scripture. No, you're not going to compare your interpretation to that. But that long line of Christians who have believed the Bible was the Word of God, the primary standard, the canon, that's what you're going to do. And so, that's how we stay within historic Christianity and don't step outside of historic Christianity and become like the people that John is talking about. Now, he says, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. Now, now how can he say that? Because when someone becomes a Christian, it's more than just a decision of the will. The Holy Spirit changes their heart and the Holy Spirit indwells them and leads them and God's providence watches over them and keeps them going in the right direction. Remember, we're the sheep, He's the shepherd, and the shepherd doesn't lose one of His. If someone truly becomes a Christian, they may stray for a little while, but you can count on the fact the shepherd's coming after them. And He will bring them back. He will. They went out so that it would be shown that they were not of us. Now, you know all these groups that, that call themselves Christians? And, and some of them, some of the people in that group, maybe they're just super confused and they need to be brought out. But you know, you'll see these TV preachers and they're saying that gold's rain, you know, raining down from the sky and that millions of people are getting healed and give them money and God will bless you and, and that whole thing. Why does God allow that? Well, the Bible tells us that everything is under God's providence, but here's something I'd like you to think about. It's something the Puritans used to say. That people are inherently spiritual. So if you get a bunch of unconverted religious people who don't really want Jesus, they just want religion or whatever that religion does for them, and they were brought in to the church among true believers, what would they do? They would just destroy everything, wouldn't they? And they would say that sometimes God will allow, or in His providence, there will be raised up this type of teacher that is not Christian, is 
can even be vile, foolish, whatever, but appears as something great and spiritual. And the true Christians look at that and will have nothing to do with it. They know this guy's a shyster. He, he doesn't love Christ. It's all about him. He's in the place of Christ. But all those other people who love spirituality, but not so much Jesus, or love spirituality for what it can do for them or how it makes them feel, that guy draws them out of the flock. And it actually protects the flock. I mean, if you, looked at, you look at some of those TV preachers, when you look at them, doesn't it kind of make you sick? Then how is it that so many people think they're basically almost like gods? So it, in the old days, if, if, if you had um, infection or poison in, in your arm and it was swelling up, they, they would put a, a thing over it, a, a moist, hot rag with some herbs and things. And you know what the intention was? To draw out the poison in order to heal and protect the arm. In the same way, sometimes these false Christs and these religious leaders that go out from Christianity and start their own thing and teach doctrines that are very contrary to Scripture, they draw out of the true church these people who don't really want Christ. They just they want money or what can God do for them? Or Do you see? And in a way, it acts in times to purify the church. But it can also be, it can be extremely dangerous. He says this, now, in verse 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know. In some translations, you know all. I don't think the translation is, is, is appropriate to say you know all because we don't know all. The Bible never tells us we know all. But he says, you all know. You have an anointing from the Holy One. If you're a true Christian, you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know. Okay, what is he talking about? The anointing from the Holy One is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit teaches us. And I believe that, that John may have in mind uh, the promise that we find in Jeremiah 31. Just turn there for a moment. In Jeremiah 31, <laughs> Jeremiah 31, verse 31. He's talking about the new covenant. This is the Old Testament. It's talking about the day when the Messiah comes, dies and rises again. And the benefit of that, the new covenant that's established uh, upon the blood of the Messiah. OK, it says in verse 31, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. He goes in 33. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now look at verse 34. And they will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. So what is he saying? You know, the, the, the nation of Israel had these laws written external, written on tablets of stone. There it was, but it, it had no transforming power. He says that when, when Christ comes, those who believe in Christ will receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will indwell them and He will, through that, write His laws on their new heart. And they will know the Lord. They'll know Him. I remember... Um, a few days, it was a few days after I became a Christian, I heard somebody preaching on campus. And I mean, I didn't know anything. I'm talking about dumb as a stump. I mean, I didn't know anything. When, I'd go to, when I would go to like the Bible studies in college and they'd say, turn to the book of Philippians, I just kind of put my Bible there and wouldn't look at it because I didn't even know where Philippians was. And see, you got me beat. And uh, well, at least some of you maybe. Um, but I mean, I was as dumb as a stump. Maybe better to say dumb as a rock. And, and this guy got up and started preaching. 
And then this really pretty girl came over and started talking to me about joining their group or something. And I just knew I got scared. It just didn't seem right. There was something wrong about it. It just they didn't talk much about Christ and they talked about other things and 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 it just it, it almost kind of scared me and i remember going back to one of the older believers on campus and and talking to him and saying you know i just came across this group man i don't know i said i don't know exactly what was wrong but i just felt like it was all wrong and he goes man it is all wrong it's one of the most dangerous cults on campus you see, when someone is truly converted, it's not that they become this magnificent theologian in a day, but they know that, well, Jesus is precious to them. They know that their salvation is through Christ alone. And they know when someone starts peddling something else, that it's just not right. When someone comes with the complexities and the, no, something's wrong. I love Jesus. Jesus saved me. I'm saved because of Jesus, because of what He did. You see? And, and I think it's good to be in a church and to be with pastors, but these guys act like they're my, you know, I don't know, spiritual dictators or something. And if I don't join their group, then I'm out. And I'm telling you that when someone becomes a believer, yes, we can be deceived to some degree. But the Holy Spirit inside of us, the providence of God, what He's done in our heart, it will make sure that even if we stray for a moment, we'll come back. He'll bring us back. You see? And so that's what, that's what He means here. When He says, but you have the anointing from the Holy One and you all know. And these super spiritual people, they don't have that. Because if they, if they truly knew Christ, they would walk in the simplicity of Christ. Of faith in Jesus Christ and love towards the brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you see? And he says, verse 21, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth. I think this is what they were being told. They were being told by these false prophets, you don't know anything. You're a bunch of spiritual, you know, novices. You... You, you don't have a clue. You don't have this deep knowledge that we have. And John comes back. This is an apostle. And he says, I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. You do know it. And what he's going to say is, leave all this silly stuff these people are talking about and stand fast in what you learned. The simplicity of the Gospel. And then he says, not because you don't know the truth, and then he says, because no lie is of the truth. Now, this is kind of difficult to interpret, but I think that what he's getting at, and, and other commentators basically would affirm this, is you know how you get in trouble? You see this in politics. And you see this in everything. Where it's like, well, you know, yeah, it's true, but, but you know, this isn't necessarily not true. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, what you're saying is right, and, and yeah, this is different, but that doesn't mean this really isn't true too. And it's a blurring of the lines, isn't it? Dear, dear young people, listen to me. Most of you, if not all of you, have a much higher IQ than I do. You're all geeks who have calculators and stuff like that. Engineering students. Well, at least some of you. Where's the girl that wears the watermelon on her head? I need her. No, but, uh, no really. What's her name? Sasha. Sasha. <laughs> but but, but here's, here's what I want you to see. I have seen this more than any other thing in my 35 years to ruin good people, good churches, and good movements where God seemed to really be doing something and began to work. And, and it's not that something comes and says, all this is wrong. But it says, this is wrong. I mean, this is right, but my version is right too. And then there's the thing that if you don't accept this version, then you're proud loveless 
and intolerant. Do you see that? And I think what John's getting at here is, no, truth is truth and a lie is a lie. And if it contradicts the truth you know, it's a lie. And I want you to hold on to that. Now, I've already told you that you and I can differ in, in, in certain things. Nobody has perfect theology. But when it comes to the fundamentals of the faith, the centrality of Christ, the preeminence of Christ, the Gospel, how is a person saved, how does a gr person grow in sanctification, when someone comes along and says, for example, yeah, you're, you know, salvation is by faith. You're right there. But also I want you to look here for a moment that if also if you don't have this and this, then, well, you know, you don't have it. If you don't have these works, if you don't do this, you don't have it. Where the Bible affirms, if it's of grace, it's not of works. And if it's of works, it's not of grace. There are going to be times, Christian, when you're going to have to stand fast. Here's the problem. In all the movies, when someone stands fast for their convictions, they're honored, aren't they? When you stand fast for yours, you're going to be attacked. You're going to be called all kinds of names. Ugly names. Stand fast. Stand fast in love, but stand fast. Okay? Because they're, the, a lie and the truth have nothing in common. Nothing in common. And though, although there are some areas where I can sit there and I can say, you know, I'm not really sure about you know, exactly what this text means in the book of Revelation here, but it's not absolutely essential for my conversion and I can show, you know, I, I don't have to be adamant about this or break fellowship with people over this one concept, even though I need to be humble in those types of things. When it comes to the fundamentals of the faith, no, I draw a line in the sand and like do Luther, you know, so help me God, here I stand. And, and so that, that's what you have to do. Now, then he says in 22, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Again, young people, listen to me. I have seen this so many times. There's a man that is growing right now in great popularity. And, uh, you know, he's on all the TV shows and everything as a spiritual guru and everything. Um, and man, it's, it's wickedly genius what he is saying. Because he says, you know, Muhammad had the truth. Jesus had the truth. Muhammad, you know, uh, the Krishna had the truth. Buddha had the truth. This guy had the truth. And man, everybody just thinks he's great because he's tolerant. But then when someone says, yeah, but Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So how can you say that Jesus has the truth and this guy has the truth and this guy has the truth when they all contradict one another? And you know what he said? When Jesus said that, it wasn't Jesus saying that. It was the Christ. It was the Christ Spirit. And the Christ Spirit dwelt in Jesus, dwelt in Muhammad, dwelt in Buddha, dwelt in this person. And so when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, He was speaking as the Christ. And He said, no one comes to the Father except through the Christ, but the Christ is in Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha. You see how wicked that is? Very, very clever. Very wicked. You can mark my words. The devil's going to attack the Word. And if he can't attack the Word, he'll twist the Word. And the one place where he's going to go, there are, there are several, but one of the main places is he's going to depreciate the person of Jesus. That he wasn't God in the flesh. That he received the Christ spirit, but he wasn't the Christ. You see, that he was a normal man and the spirit of Christ just came upon him. A lot of people in history have said that happened during his baptism. That he was a normal man up to that point. You see, they're always going to depreciate and destroy, attack the character of Christ, the attributes of Christ. You are not Christian. Now, you have the freedom to do this, and you can be whatever you want, but you're not Christian if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. You are not Christian if you do not believe Jesus is the Christ, 
If you believe that He received some spirit of the Christ, you're not a Christian. Do you see? And that's what's, that's what's going on here. He says, Who is a liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Okay? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. I, I f- would find it very frequent in my early praying when I was younger to say this, Father, I know I have no... Apart from Jesus Christ, I have no part with You. And that's true. You have no part with God apart from Jesus Christ. His life and atoning work on Calvary and His resurrection. Jesus the Christ. Okay? Not someone who received the Spirit of the Christ. Now, there were in this time, of course, some Jewish, many Jewish people who believed that Jesus was not the Christ. Okay? But this seems to be a kind of an even different group than that. Okay? And we see that thing continue on today. I believe Jesus was a good man, people will say. But I don't believe He was the Son of God. I believe He was a good man, but I don't believe He was God in the flesh. I believe He was a good man, but I don't believe He was the Messiah. Well, here's the problem. And C.S. Lewis called this, how many of you ever heard of it? It's the trilemma. Okay? In the trilemma, here's the problem. Jesus said He was God. Jesus said He was the Christ. That only leaves us with the following options. One, He was the greatest liar who ever lived because He knew He wasn't the Son of God. He knew He wasn't the Christ. And He told everybody that He was. And He's deceived more people than anyone else that's ever lived. Okay? Or, Jesus was very sincere but a lunatic. I mean, if you go to class tomorrow and there's a guy standing out in the middle of the quad or whatever you call it here on a park bench you know, with tinfoil on his head, screaming out that he's the Son of God who came from the planet Uranus, you're going to think this guy's out of his cotton-picking mind, right? So Jesus was either a liar or he was a lunatic because he said he was God. And anyone who says they're God and not God and they're sincere about it, they're a lunatic. But does a liar die for his lies? And does a lunatic leave teaching that literally transformed the world. Third option, and the only real option, is this. Jesus Christ is exactly who He said He was. He's the Son of God, God in the flesh, God incarnate. Okay? And if you ever depart from that young person, you may call yourself whatever you want, but you are not Christian. Because this whole thing of Christianity, I mean, think about the name. It's all about Him. Okay, Let, let's hurry on through this. Um, look at verse 23. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Um, everything the Father has ever done, He's done it for His Son. He loves His Son. You deny His Son, you don't have the Father. You know, I've been in culture, especially in Latin America and in Africa, but I saw this a lot in Latin America because I lived there. Um, It was really neat to me because the culture was so different. But I found out this, that if, if, like, I'm at language school and I meet this Peruvian guy, we hit it off, we play basketball or whatever together, and he says, hey, come to my house and eat with my family. When I walked in that house, it was like I was family. Why? Because I was the son's friend. The father treated me, honored me, treated me almost like a son because I was the son's friend. Because I knew the son, the son knew me. I've seen that in cultures. But in Christianity, I mean, that's the deal. It's all about the Son. Okay? Now, just really quick. In in 24, As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. And I say the same thing to you. I want you to grow in Christ. 
But listen to my language. Grow in Christ. Never grow above Christ. Never grow out of Christ. Never think that anything, even in Christianity, is bigger than Christ. Okay? Not the gifts, not anything. Nothing is bigger. Nothing's more important. Nothing is more central. Nothing is preeminent but Jesus Christ. And he's saying, remain in this simple message. Goodness gracious, you know, I've got shoes older than, than you kids. I've been doing this a long time. And it's still the same. He, he shed His own blood for my soul. That's everything to me. You take away all, my, take whatever knowledge I have, whatever I've read in other languages, whatever the patriarchs, whatever. I don't take it all away. Leave me with one thing. When I woke up after my heart attack, and I say, you know, what happened? And the little neurologist goes, "You die three times." <laughs> you know, what did I remember? Not much, but this, Jesus. A friend of mine was a triathlete back in seminary when triathlons were I guess, just getting started. You know, they still had rock wheels on the bicycles. And uh, he, he was hit by a car and he had amnesia. He, he literally lost all of his memory. He didn't know who he was or anything for like a year or so. And uh, they sent him down to Peru actually because he and I used to cycle together. And they sent him down to Peru hoping he might get his memory back because I was such a good friend. And I asked him, I said, Richard, I said, what, uh, what happened? I said, what did you remember when you woke up? He said, when I woke up, he goes, I, I was dying of a heart attack. And they were trying, to, and I said, heart attack? I said, dude, you're like, he goes, no, I was so scared. I couldn't breathe. My heart rate, everything was just going crazy. I was terrified. I wake up. I don't know who I am. I don't know anything. And I said, then what? And he goes, I remembered Jesus. Jesus died for me. I knew who He was. And I said, what happened? He said, it is well with my soul. You see that? Don't ever grow out of that because you've become a fool. You have become a fool. He says, let, what, let that abide in you which, you which you heard from the beginning. If, that, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And what is that? Jesus died for my sins according to the Scriptures and He was buried and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Alright. We've gone a little long. I'm going to finish with one of my favorite stories. Try to get through it because no matter how many times I tell it, it's about this, uh, you know, this this painter, and he paints all the time with his son. Famous painter, and then World War One occurs. The son goes off to war. He doesn't hear any news from him. After the war, all he knows is his son has died. One day, there's a knock at the door, and there's a young soldier standing there. And he said, "Yes." And he said, uh, "I uh, just want you to know." I said, "He said, uh, I was with your son almost the whole tour." And uh, he actually died uh, for me. He, I'm so sorry, he jumped in front of a bullet. He died for me. And he said, I know he was a great artist. And when we weren't fighting, I always wanted to draw, but I, I couldn't draw. But he would teach me how to draw. And he said, I know this is horrible. You know, it doesn't. But I drew a picture of your son. And I just wanted to give it to you. And he opened it up and it was, yeah, really one-dimensional, not that good of art. But the father said, thank you so much. You have no idea how much it means to me. So the, the young man left and eventually the man died. He was a famous artist, all his paintings. So everybody, every different auction house in the world was there to bid after his paintings. And the man who was the auctioneer, he began by opening up a piece of paper and saying, um, before, you know, before we start the main auction, there is one special drawing that is to be auctioned off. And they, they showed it, they unveiled it, and it was the young soldier's picture of the sun. And everyone just started laughing. They said, that's the most horrible, I mean, 
Come on, we didn't travel all this way for this joke. Get that stinking... It's just horrible. Well, the young soldier was sitting in the, uh, in the auctioneer house. And he could hear the people laughing, not so much about the painting, but the subject of the painting. It's not even a true story, but the truth that... And so the auctioneer goes, who will give me, you know, 1,000? People just laughed. Who will give me 2,000? People just laughed. said, come on, quit this. Soldier stands up and says, I have half my month's pay. It's all I have. But please give me that picture. Because it's the picture of the Son. The one who died for me. He said, sold. They handed him the picture. And then the auctioneer takes up the mallet, slams it down on the pulpit, and says, the auction is over. And all these people, what do you mean the auction's over? The auction hasn't even begun yet. And he opens up an envelope. He pulls out the will. And it says, the one who takes my son gets it all. That's, that's the Father's Word to us. That's Christianity. The one who takes the Son gets it all. And see, people talk about heaven. The older you get, you think more about it. But really, I don't care. The Christian would rather be in hell with Jesus than in heaven without Him. Of course, that's not happening. But my whole point is that if you ever let go of that, you, you have nothing. You have nothing. If you become the greatest supposed theologian in the world and Christ is not precious to you, you're, you're an idiot. You're a fool. You've lost everything. You're ugly and twisted and deformed. Everything is Jesus. I could sound more sophisticated by saying everything is the Son of God or everything is the Christ. Because that name Jesus is so mocked, isn't it? But I like to say it that way. Jesus is everything. Everything. All right, let's pray. Father, thank You so much for these young people. And I pray, Lord, that having taken hold of Christ and been taken hold by Christ, they will never want anything more but a greater and fresher revelation of Him. In Jesus' name, Amen.